helps, uh, brings a wide range of experience in, uh, in uh, design, implementation, and uh, you know, is uh, one of the uh, principals of Brooklyn Media. He brings many years of experience to the table. We also have Chris Zimmer and uh, Joe uh, Ashba from uh, Imagine Communications. Uh, Joe uh, leads the Image uh, Imagine Communications uh, Cloud Playout Strategy Technology Partnership Team. And uh, Joe is, uh, serves as a solutions architect at uh, Imagine Communications. We also have from Telestream, uh, the cloud business development uh, lead, which is uh, Alex uh, Emmerman. And Alex uh, has uh, been doing a lot of cloud work over the past 10 years and uh, was previously at uh, IBM. We also have uh, Evan uh, Stratton, uh, is with uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, and is a principal architect. He has uh, helped many broadcasters in uh, the industry work through uh, cloud migration. And we also have uh, Liam uh, Morrison. He is a principal architect for machine learning, and we'll discuss uh, some of the some of the newer uh, machine learning. Uh, capabilities that can be placed in the cloud. So uh, without further uh, ado, we're going to uh, pass it over now to uh, our first presenter, who would be uh, Rick uh, Phelps from Brooklyn Media. So yeah, I'm Rick Phelps with Brooklyn Media. I've worked in media since about 2006 when I joined a company called Liberty Global over in Europe. And I've done a tour of duty through various um, companies in the, in the industry and started Brooklyn Media about a year ago, um, focusing on virtualized services. And you're going to see a lot of interesting um, uh, specific use cases tonight from my uh, fellow presenters. So what I wanted to focus on here was um, just some general principles around um, you know, migrating services to the cloud. So I want to, want to talk about was um, the current state of assets, um, you know, where they're at in your, in your, you know, across your enterprise today. I think it's really important to get these, these things in a certain um, order before you move them to the cloud. So you want to get them organized, um, that's your media assets. You want to try to keep it in the highest resolution that you have. You want to get all your components in shape. Um, you want to look at things like naming conventions and the metadata and the rules around metadata. That's really important before you move things to the cloud. Um, otherwise, you might just end up moving a bunch of disparate stuff to the cloud and then have to organize it there where it can get uh, quite expensive to do so, right? Um, you want to really define the workflows that you have before you move to the cloud. And then when you do want to move to the cloud, you want to look at you know, private versus public versus a hybrid cloud um, setup, whatever works best for you guys. Um, and then when you, once you have things in the cloud, you wanna look at how you utilize other services that are available in the cloud. Um, do you wanna run things on bare metal? Do you wanna go serverless? Um, and then, you know, how do you utilize analytics to make sure you're getting the most out at, of at, at what you're doing in the cloud? And then once you have all that stuff in order, then you're ready to do things in the cloud and distribute content globally to monetize it. All right, so the main goal is, right, um, you're you know, reducing your total cost of ownership. And what I call it is reduce your total cost of cloud ownership. Um, and we'll dive deeper into some of those elements that are discussed in the table of contents now. All right, so what is the current state of your libraries, right? So you may have a, a new service that you're running, or you may be somebody that's ran services for years. So you may have content that sits on maybe near line storage. You might have disk archives. You might have LTO. You might have um, different uh, USB drives around. Could be in different locations around the world as well, right? And not only is it could it be on different storage systems, it could be in different formats, right? You could have 
TIFF sequences, uh, you could have ProRes, J2K, you could have, you know, HD cam, different frame rates. You probably have, if you have a big library, you probably have a lot of duplicates. I've looked um, at, at some um, content libraries and I've seen, you know, almost nearly a hundred different versions of the same title. So what you want to do before you move that to the cloud is, is try to get that and dedupe it as much as possible. So you save on cloud storage. And the other thing, which is really important is the metadata. What, what do you have, if you have any at all, and is it in the shape and form that you need to make it usable once you do move things into the cloud? So getting organized, right? Um, there's ways now that you can scan your libraries to see what exactly it is you have from a video le level. Um, you can look at the audio versions that you have. Um, you can look at the subtitles. You can, you know, you can capture all that metadata and look to try to catalog the library that you have. Because the most important thing you want to do before you move to the cloud is try to deduplicate your library. You don't want to have multiple versions of assets sitting up there because it, you know, it could be six, seven times the amount of stores that you may need on a, on a ongoing basis going forward, right? All right, so then you also wanna look at your organizational structure, right? What are the hierarchies? You have a title, um, is it a film? Is it a, a series? So how are you gonna structure the hierarchy around your video content? That's very important. The other thing you wanna do is look at naming conventions around the files. You may have files that, uh, um, have different names, but it could have the same content with. So the naming convention is really important because when you have um, assets in the library, you'll have a title that has a certain name and you want to make sure all the subcomponents that go with that are also, you know, aligned with that naming convention. There's different storage containers you can do that help with that, like IMF and MXF. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more in depth. Um, but really what you want to do is get to a component-based architecture of your storage. So you're storing just the essence files that you need. Um, the metadata, right? So this is the most important part. I think it's always underutilized or under, you know, under thought. Um, but the metadata is really important because not only are you using it, you know, to tag your assets for, um, with, 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 um, information so you can find it, but you also want it to be very descriptive or administrative metadata as well. So you can actually get into the details of the assets that you have and what formats they're in. But also you want to tag it even further to the actual, you know, almost frame by frame in the video if you can, so you can make it very discoverable. The more discoverable your content is, the better it is to monetize it um, going forward. So just as a better example of this, right, is IMF. And I'm not sure how familiar folks are with this. It's the interoperable master format. Um, this is a, you know, format that's being used more and more. I think Netflix was a big pusher of this initially, but a lot of people are starting to embrace this. But I like the philosophy behind it because what you're doing in essence is componentizing your library. And that means storing the essence files as individual elements. So. And I have an IMF package contains all the essence files, right, separately. So audio, video, language versions of, of, of audio, metadata, subtitles, captions, you know, images, all those things are treated as different elements, different assets. And they, they can be combined into what's called a CPL, like a component uh, composition playlist in IMF. Um, so for example, you may have one CPL that's your original version, and then a separate CPL that replaces or adds in the French dub and creates a French version of that, right? So you don't have to keep an original version and then a French version in two, with two separate video tracks. You only store the French audio and, and use a CPL that will describe that when you publish it. Um, you, you, know, you have multiple different versions that you can use this with even with different, you know, end credits or end, end um, 
overlays or those types of things, you can create a separate CPL for the specific version that you have. So in essence, what you're doing is storing like the recipes for uh, the ingredients, right? For making cakes, right? You have the ingredients on your shelves, the CPL is like a recipe. So if you want a chocolate cake, you take certain ingredients and you, and you bake that chocolate cake. The IMF does that um, in a similar way with your media. What it does though, is really it simplifies your distribution workflows, right? So if you have all these elements stored and tagged on, on, in the IMF structure, when you need that French version to go, you actually just create that CPL and you, you package it up and, and distribute it when, when, you, when you need it. Netflix is what they're doing is, is they're, um, you know, embracing the IMF historically, but what they're doing now is so when you want to send an updated version in, you don't have to send the video back in. You just send the supplemental data, which could be a French audio file if it's a French version, and they would match it up to the IMF that they have on their uh, cloud infrastructure. Simpty has a, a standard that you can read up on the 2067. So once you, you, you've got your kind of naming conventions and your, your container structures that you want to work with, um, you need to look and define that, you, you know, your existing workflows. How are you acquiring, you know, your media? Is it live? Is it, you know, file-based? Um, is it coming in via FTP or is it going to be bucket-to-bucket -bucket transfers? Um, what do you need to do to um, transform that content? Um, and then in the end, what do you need to do, you know, to distribute it? So what I, I, I have this little formula here, it's called D minus A equals T. So in essence, what you have is you have the content side on the left, right? And all the platform sides on the right. All the platforms have a different potential specification of what they want you to send them. It could be different metadata, it could be different video specifications, you know, different audio specifications. So the sum of all those distribution specifications equals, you know, um, you know, equals what you need to be able to distribute on a on a day by day basis. So when you look at your acquisition content, what that shape is and format is, then you know exactly what the workflows are that you need to do to transform all that content and distribute it out. So metadata is a good example, right? The sum of all the different ADI or XML format schemas that you have from the end platforms, that kind of equals your master schema of metadata that you would have to store in order to distribute to those platforms. So when you get content in, you can run a check on it to see how it, you know, what the deltas are between the existing content you have, the, the platform specifications, and then what you need to do to transform that. Here's just an example of a ingest workflow that we use um, where we're bringing content in, whether it's live or file-based content, we bring it in various, you know, via various different distribution formats, right? Aspera, S3 bucket to buckets, FTP. We take everything inbound and what we try to do is demux it and put it into a, either an IMF or an MF, MXF type um, containerized package. And then we run things like, um, you know, QC against that. We've got some of our own AI that we use to examine the, the, the media. We can call out to third party AI as well. So what we're trying to do here is get it into what we call finished goods, right? So this is the mezzanine format that we need based upon all the end destinations that we know we're going to be delivering to. Here's where you can actually interface with third party metadata services. You can interface with versioning studios to supply you dubs, subtitles, captions, audio description, and those types of things as well. Another workflow at this stage that we do a lot, you know, cloud-based more and more now as well is allowing for remote editing. So we do a lot of international distribution and we need people to be able to um, look at the content and create versions for different markets. So what we try to do is bring people to the content versus sending content out to whether it's a dubbing facility house or a remote compliance editing facility. 
we like to let them access the content on our storage, on our cloud storage versus sending out proxies because it kind of gets out of control when you do that. So I think one of the benefits of cloud workflows is, is, is the fact that you can actually bring people to the content and try to keep that content in one location so you keep control of it. A lot of things that you've seen probably over the last, especially with COVID accelerating was, was team collaboration around these types of workflows in the cloud. You know, it, it, was, it was something that people were talking about a year ago and now we're doing it. Okay, so once you have all that done, right? You've got your, 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 your assets in a containerized um, methodology that you wanna use. Um, now you can start to migrate to the cloud, right? So you've got some choices there when you do that, right? You've got private cloud, you've got public cloud, you've got a hybrid. Private cloud and, and on-prem are, are, are pretty similar, I think, um, but it's, it's still something you need to think about as well. But I think some of the benefits, there, there's pros and cons to both of them. Um, private cloud, you can kind of control some of the monthly recurring costs around egress and things like that because you can you know, buy dedicated bandwidth. If you have sensitive data, you might wanna consider keeping that on private cloud. Um, you're not necessarily sharing resources um, with other folks where you potentially on public cloud, you, you, you can be in a way. Um, and the other key thing about it is it's really customizable for your workflows. Um, public cloud has come a long way. Um, and as you'll see in the, with the, the you know, presentations after this, there's, you know, there's a lot of things you can do that, that kind of mitigate this. Um, but the, uh, the other thing with private cloud, it gives you, you, you know, financing options as well, whether you want to OpEx or CapEx, um, and there's pros and cons to both of those. Public cloud is great, right? It's, 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 you know, pay as you go. It's extremely flexible. It's great for, you know, launching new services, OU services. Um, if, you know, if you, if you, if you're, running services that you know you don't have the bandwidth necessarily on your private cloud you can use public cloud in, in order to get up to uh to um speed on your private cloud um it's extremely scalable extremely reliable um and it also has a global kind of footprint where you can move things into different regions hybrid cloud which is what we primarily use is um you know kind of gives you the best of both and allows for gradual migration over towards, you know, full public cloud or wherever you want to be in, in, with your goals. All right, so once you're in the cloud, right, there's tons of different cloud microservices and you'll see a lot more details on that in the ensuing presentations, but you know, you, you do things like transcoding, frame rate conversions, play out, packaging, watermarking. There's just an, uh, an amazing number of microservices now that are available in the cloud. Um, I think what's important is, is how you're going to run these services, right? So typically what you've done in the cloud is you've used, uh, you know, a, a, like Amazon has the EC2 instances. So you're just renting a machine in the cloud to run a service. And that's a great way to do things, right? You can use, um, you know, Docker containers to, to manage and deploy applications rather um, rapidly and, and, and very scalable and, and, it's very flexible as well. Um, what, what you're seeing now more and more is, is this serverless, which is actually where you're just running the, the actual processing to run an application versus trying to run a whole machine to do um, something that may be a bit overkill for what the, the service is. And what you're finding is, and what we're finding is, is that more and more software vendors, even though, you know, old hardware vendors who are becoming software vendors are starting to provide this serverless type um, applications where you only use it and pay for it, you, you know, by the by the minute versus actually trying to dedicate a box for a month or something like that as cloud. And this is going to, I think, have a, an amazing impact on the actual cost of cloud. And you'll probably hear more about this in the in the later presentations. But I think it's one of the key things is when you're looking at cloud services is finding the right software that, that makes sense for, for your business and ensuring that you, you, you have the most flexible model against using that. If it's something that you're using occasionally, you know, running things as pay as you go on a serverless environment is great for that. And if you have some scale, 
you may want to get some dedicated resources to, to support those types of um, applications that you may have. So, what, yeah, so I kind of went through that fast. It was a lot to try to get across. But once you, um, once you get all that set up and your workflow is defined, and then you, you can really use, utilize cloud now and public internet for a lot of the traditional um, distribution that you typically did, had to do on-prem, right? So you can, you can do your, your live linear now globally out of the cloud. You can do OU services where, you, you know, you can use, you know, in, intra-cloud um, distribution to, you know, pick up a signal in one location in the world and hand it off to another location across the world. And then you can still, out of the cloud, you can still egress into your traditional IP satellite and fiber um, type services as well. Um, a lot of the you know, VOD distribution now, whether it's flat file or IMF distribution is actually happening in, in the cloud, right? So if you're running your IMF workflows in the cloud and you're delivering to Netflix, you're, in essence, you're doing a bucket to bucket transfer to do that, right? Um, and more and more OT, OTT services are being managed out of the cloud now as well, where your origin um, straight out of the cloud with the CDN that's available there. Um, and then it gives you a lot of flexibility around that. Some people want an MRSS feed. Some people you need to deliver different ABR stacks. Some people want dynamic ad insertion. Cloud allows you to you know, spin those things up and down as, as needed. Um, and then some of the workflows that we're doing in the cloud now, kind of our hybrid cloud is play out workflow, right? So we've got our you know, finished goods from our clients in our mezzanine format. We spin up a, you know, a play out instance and deliver that out, whether it's going out as a SDI feed or a IP stream that's going into, um, you know, public internet distribution to a, whether an uplink provider or a platform, we can manage all those on a, on a kind of a spin up and spin down basis now. Um, in some cases, we need to deliver ABRs, you know, for a simulcast, we can spin those up on the fly. Um, we can add in dynamic ad insertion if required on those CDN deliverable streams, um, but it gives us this amazing flexibility to, you know, deliver things and spin up channels in a matter of days versus what used to cost, you know, a lot of capex and a lot of time to get set up and structured. Same thing with the finished goods, right? So now if somebody, in essence, what they're doing is giving us their finished goods, you know, their, their content. And, and we're, you, you know, once they get an order for it, we either spin up a play out channel for them or we deliver, a, you know, VOD packages for them. And we can do that globally as well. And this is all happens in the cloud. When they sign up a new deal, we can deliver that content within a matter of, um, you know, hours or, or days of, well, yeah, so, and I think you'll see more of this later as well. So you can, I talked a, a, briefly about it is, is you now have the ability using cloud infrastructure to pick up feeds, you know, anywhere and, you know, turn those into any type of feed and hand them out, whether it's a, a stream that somebody's taking or you're actually using an edge device. Um, um, but there's infinite flexibility now to scale these up and scale these down and use you know, a lot of open source standards that are out there to make it extremely cost effective. So um, that's all I have. Great. Thanks. Okay. Back to Ed. Thank you, Rick. Uh, yeah. We have a question from the audience, which is uh, how, how do you, um, how does your edit workstation, uh, your workflow address HDR and audio editing challenges? Okay, yeah. So we haven't, we're, we're looking at doing more of this. We haven't done it so much um, to date with Brooklyn because we're relatively young, but I think it's really down to the bandwidth that you have um, out of your cloud and into your, your remote workstations. And you're seeing more and more um, of people um, providing solutions that do this, where instead of sending out a lot of what you saw, you know, probably up to a year ago um, was where you would sync high res content on different drives globally where people had access to that to do a kind of a globalized workflow. But what you're seeing now with, um, um, you know, um, video over IP, 
um, if the bandwidth is there, you're, you're, you're starting to see people start to do these types of um, workflows with HDR10 and you know, high res workflows um, from the cloud source out, out. And maybe the Amazon guys might have a bit more insight into that and Telestream as well. So thank you, Rick. Uh, next up, we have uh, Chris Zimmer and uh, uh, Joe Ash Ash Ashba from Imagine Communications. So um, take it take it away, Chris. All right, well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Chris Zimmer at Imagine Communications. I manage um, many of our strategic account endeavors as well as our um, cloud technology partnerships, among them AWS. So thrilled to be on the panel with them today. Um, Joe Ashby will, will be up next. Ed uh, warned me when we were preparing for this that the E in SIMTI stands for engineer. So be prepared with uh, with backup. So we'll have the, the biz dev element of this go first and we'll quickly turn it over to Joe to run through the more technical elements of it. So we're having this discussion tonight because the media and entertainment landscape is just changing dramatically. There's an increasingly fragmented audience, right? Content owners and broadcasters are being asked to serve a very, very content hungry audience. Um, it's an always on consumer. The demand for content is just happening at an unparalleled scale. Um, along with that, increasing um, ad revenue is becoming increasingly difficult as linear revenues decline and business models need to turn to launching AVOD and SVOD, other direct to consumer services and content owners and broadcasters need to experiment with new business models and the existing technology stack just doesn't support it. Um, along with that, the constant need to reduce operating costs as the M&A activity across the industry continues, the, the, the consolidation and automation of, of operations becomes more and more necessary. Um, I think most importantly, um, when we talk about TCO and operational cost, business opportunities have to be aligned to revenue expectations. And our old kind of big iron broadcasty way of doing things just doesn't facilitate that very easily, you know, building a big monolithic system that's a, a one size fits all channel service model isn't gonna scale to these challenges. So we've all got to learn to be agile. We've got to build an open and standards-based ecosystem that scales with revenue. It's got to be consistent with predictable results. It's got to be scalable, agile, efficient, and resilient. And you're gonna need the cloud to do it. So Imagine's view of that is, you know, what I call the, the advertising and content distribution ecosystem, right? It's really about monetization at the end of the day, right? When we look at tonight's topic, linear playout, which you see on the, the bottom here and OTT playout, we really shouldn't separate the two. Um, it's all driven by an overarching advertising management system that's gotta be intrinsically linked to it. You know, we look at playout as the necessary extension of the monetization engines, right? Um, we've been doing this a long time. And again, the needs of today, when we talk about the, the, the need to, to serve this adaptive audience, the need to facilitate new revenue streams very, very quickly, unify OTT and linear workflows and distribution um, streams, we look at cloud very much as 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 the answer right you know we look to build an advertising ecosystem that's very open and api based right and we look to ensure that we're you know checking all the boxes of cloud infrastructure security um end-to-end -end monitoring um etc so we're going to drill in to the bottom row, the linear playout and OTT delivery, because again, I don't think we we should we should we should bifurcate the two. And if we look at channel launch specifically, the business drivers that drive that, you know, are are, are really pretty pretty obvious. I think at this point, right? Um, location independence, right? You know, decoupling from the facility. Um, we've learned in the time of COVID um, is, is certainly necessary, removing dependence on the, uh, the, the facility. Um, again, the, the ability to 
enable new revenue models by flexing services up and down very quickly and facilitating um, new and experimental business models. Um, availability options, again, aligning costs to revenue expectations, right? A, you know, 24 seven high revenue sports producing channel, you know, that has has a different revenue expectation than a, 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 a DigiNet and the cost of that service and the availability of that service should be able to scale accordingly. Um, again, we look at this as an end-to-end -end media supply chain workflow play out is not a discrete process and Joe will dig into that in, uh, in his presentation a bit. Um, and I think uh, that's it for me, Joe. I will turn it over to you. So there's a question now of how we make everything that Chris just mentioned a reality, right? How do we make that a reality for our customers? How do we make the smart platform that is simple to operate and expand, that is economical for them in every way, that's agile and flexible to what's going on in cloud and uh, changeable to their needs? So we don't look at deployment as just launching services, right? It's a lot more than just spinning up stuff fast. It's it's so much more than that. It's the first plan we make with the customer all the way to the last week before we go live. So our strategy in deployment needs to be very all encompassing, especially when you look at cloud and everything it can bring to an, an operating environment. So for us, that broke, uh, that broke down into four sort of pillars here. Um, simple, economical, smart, and flexible. And each one of these are so intrinsically linked together um, that I might bounce around um, from one to the other as I describe them. But Let's start with uh, smart first. So smart really aligns with um, just making sure that when we when we launch Versio uh, in um, in an operating environment, we're utilizing the best features of that environment to make it the best plot, you know, the best you know uh, version of Versio it can be. And in um, in, in 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 public cloud, um, that provides so many opportunities for new pieces of the puzzle, the overall puzzle. You know, we build with the building blocks that that. that that Imagine brings to the table in Versio. When we move into a cloud architecture, we're able to take the, the great building blocks that a cloud provider creates for us and bring those into the Versio environment and strengthen the platform. Um, so Smart really talks about that point, making sure that we're optimizing our platform for the best uses in the cloud that we can. Um, let's talk about economical next. So if we're really smart and we plan strategically to make our, our platform as optimized as possible in the cloud, then we're also making a very smart economical choice uh, for our customers by being able to create the most cost-effective solution uh, in the cloud. Again, we don't, and, and that's for a few reasons, right? We don't want to be over-utilizing resources in the cloud provider space uh, in so much as we also don't want our customers paying for resources that they don't need. So we're constantly looking at the platform and finding ways that we can adapt it and change it and modify it as we grow it to uh, to serve a more economical need and to use less resources in the cloud. Um, next, I'll talk about uh, flexible, where we really, we, we see cloud as an opportunity for a few really interesting things to happen here uh, moving forward with broadcasting. Cloud gives you an immediate ability to launch pop-up channels, to do non-traditional channels, to experiment with channels and channel lineups and, and figure out you know, what, what new, you know, what new network you might try to build, you know, is there, is there an audience for that? Can we monetize that? Can we test that on a smaller scale? The cloud gives you the perfect opportunity to sort of launch those test platforms uh, rapidly, ga you know, gauge the metric from them, and then react accordingly to that. So flexibility really talks about that ability to go way beyond just linear TV distribution. And we'll go all the way back to simple and realize that none of this is, right? This is all very complex, but we want it to be as simple as possible, not just for the customer to spin up new channels and to grow that environment and to be really agile and flexible there. But we also want it to be uh, simple for us as well, uh, because if the platform is simple to deploy and simple to configure and simple to operate, then that's better not only for Imagine getting a customer spun up and to error quicker, but it's also better for the customer. So those are the four pillars and the ways we sort of we sort of distilled what we've learned about cloud and the way we want to approach growing our platform in cloud moving forward. Chris, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, uh, like Chris said, uh, the E stands for engineers. So we're going to look at a diagram now. And I'm actually going to blow that up full screen on my desk. And I hope my glasses aren't too reflective for folks. Um, 
And there is a lot going on here. And this again, might look like a, a very uh, non-simple diagram. Um, I'll start by uh, describing exactly what this architecture is. So this is how we optimized Versio in AWS. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with AWS's color scheming and nomenclature, uh, orange is EC2, and that's um, you know, launching a virtualized server uh, up in AWS. This diagram last year had double the orange, and I, I mentioned that to speak to um, those four pillars going back and, and talking about how we're constantly optimizing, right? We want to we want to eliminate as much orange as possible from this diagram and bring in as many AWS services into the picture as possible. Now, why do we want to do that? And we're going back to smart and using their technology. And that's basically best of breed, right? So we're able to bring in now um, the elastic load balancer into our platform and use it instead of using EC2 instances to run um, proxy server cluster. Um, we're able to use their database service to run some of our databases and actively working on um, utilizing them for all of our database needs in the near future. Um, Another near future uh, Amazon service uses Amazon MQ. This year we'll be launching um, MQ as an ability um, to use that service instead of a cluster of, um, of, of um, a rabbit instances. So we're using as many services as possible for that on the, on the core services architecture side. And you'll notice that we have um, a couple of those. We have two nodes, one in availability zones A and B, and we also spread some of these services over into availability zone C. So we are operating in multiple availability zones. So we get some level of geographic redundancy with our playout environment. Um, we do maintain uh, synchronization of the playheads across those availability zones with our redundancy service. Um, and that sort of gives, well, that doesn't sort of give, that definitely gives a, a, a degree of, of comfortableness and confidence that you can reliably run um, a secondary channel in a geographically dispersed location and trust that that channel is going to keep you on air. Um, the next piece of that is what happens with all of those transport streams once we've generated them and we need to distribute them. Well, um, you know, like we just talked about before with the, with the wealth of distribution options available in cloud, um, specific to AWS, they provide a, a wealth of media services um, via elemental uh, technologies to bring a lot of power uh, to their environment for us to all tap into. I'll just talk about a few of them here in the diagram. Uh, the Media Connect uh, transport stream service gives us the ability to create, you know, um, routable um, streams. So we can send the outputs uh, to anywhere. We can distribute them via Media Connect. We can also use Media Live or Media Package to either publish that channel as a direct linear service to a CDN, or we can use Media Package and package that as OTT and then deliver that as HLS. So you have right within one environment, all the different ways for which you really would want to get your signal out there. And they're all just sort of readily available right here. So the cloud really sort of makes that possible. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about S3 storage and the way we use that as well. Um, we use S3 storage as the sort of uh, primary IO point. We sort of call that the gateway for media assets. Um, and we, we started just using it, as I just said, as, as sort of a storage gateway and just bringing assets in, but it very quickly became more than that once we realized that we can pair the, the immense power of a Lambda functions and step functions together to create lots of little serverless code executions. And by using those, we're able to develop, like I said, a little gateway where we're doing a lot more than just storing and retrieving assets now. Every time an asset hits our S3 bucket, we're doing a, a lot of things to it. We're doing um, scans and quality control checks, which will um, pass that file into Media Convert. If, for example, the audio channels are incorrect, we detect an issue there, we can sort of correct that in Media Convert. Um, if we detect a file doesn't have closed captioning and isn't FCC compliant, we'll immediately, without operator in intervention, we're working to pass those files directly um, into um, Transcribe and pass the audio file from the, from the asset, uh, mind you, and to transcribe to have it generate a closed caption file that we can then process for error. And again, all of this is supposed to be non-operator driven. These are automated processes that happen before the file even touches the environment. So we've looked at those technologies and those abilities as a stepping stone to really strengthening our platform and growing it and, and, and looking at, and the, uh, at public cloud as a way to, to, to make sure that when we launch these things, we're always launching the best version of our channel, right? Um, what else could I talk about on this diagram? Um, and we're also using um, um, direct connect uh, if necessary, if, um, if we have customers who are um, 
who are sending their transport streams directly to, let's say, an on-prem IRD, or you want to go back to an on-prem distribution point, then using direct connect can send those streams down. Again, we can send those through Media Connect or a Zixi or an SRT or a Riskbox in, in, in any number of ways. Um, and we've also begun uh, specifically to the AWS environment, begun using what, um, what's known as an, an, an Amazon workspace. So for anyone watching who doesn't know what a workspace is, um, it's a thick client, um, like it's like an RDP desktop protocol, but you actually launch a complete desktop inside your own virtual private cloud, and it's a secure encrypted tunnel. So in this way, you can launch an operator desktop or a graphic designer desktop or um, an engineering desktop or a management sort of remote viewing desktop. And you can have desktops of different types right into your operating environment for your master control operators. And you can, um, you know, like I said, also use this for um, the graphics design team. You can use this for the engineering staff on site. And, um, you know, we used it uh, to set up our live environments that are currently running today from home during, during um, 2020. So workspaces have also given our, our customers the ability to say, when we launch uh, a play out network in the public cloud in AWS, we can then also remotely monitor and access and drive it. Uh, using workspaces in a secure way. So we're really, really thrilled about giving our customers the option to do that in a much more secure way than a VPN connection would be. Chris, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so I don't want to steal too much of AWS's thunder uh, since they'll be coming up uh, after us and talking a bit. I just wanted to talk briefly about um, um, some new technology coming from them called CDI. Um, that's, um, I believe it's cloud digital interface and uh, our integration of it. So um, when we heard about this, it was, it was something we, we immediately wanted to take advantage of because it, it, it provides for our customers a new option in, in how they want and what they need to do in cloud, right? There are some customers may just want to run, you know, what we call video jukeboxes, just, you know, clip, clip reels of playback. And for that purpose, using this type of low latency integration might not make a lot of sense, but having this as part of our toolkit gives us the ability to say, yes, now when we're doing live applications in the cloud, when we're bringing streams up into a Versio and, and you know producing that type of content, we need to make sure that that is at the lowest latency possible. And this gives us that capability. Chris, can you jump to the last slide, please? And then this is just a, 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 a small diagram to sort of example what that, what, what, what that looks like. Again, using CDI, giving you that sort of instant latency, that, that sub 80 millisecond ground to cloud latency. It, again, it opens a lot of doors. Um, our, our vision for that is that there is a flow orchestrator or some type of um, you know, programmatic uh, way to, to, to change over and to control all of those, uh, those feeds. Um, it would work uh, in combination with uh, REST API and talk directly to our Versio engines and then be able to sort of manage any number of those CDI um, JPEG SS connections up in the cloud. At the same time, getting them up from the ground to the cloud is also a concern. And we want to um, we want to wash that concern away as well by um, presenting the ability to do that JPEG XS CDI bridge directly in um, one of our other products, the Selenium Network Processor, which is also um, being looked at. So. With an SNP on-prem, you could then take your, um, your baseband or your 2110 feeds, feed those into the SNP, and let that go over a direct connect bridge uh, to the cloud instance directly into your playout environment, giving you that instantaneous access. And again, that's, that's just another tool in the kit. It's an ability for those needing live integration, needing you know, really robust live application use in the cloud this sort of opens the door for that. And, and we wanted to make sure that that was part of the platform so that that would be available in the future. Thank you very much, Joe and Chris. Thank you. So next up we have uh, Alex uh, Emmerman from Telestream and uh, he is the cloud, he is in charge of cloud business development. So um, Alex, take it away. You know, I'm gonna start uh, a, little, a little differently, uh, a little different than I expected. Um, I was an engineer for many years before I was in business development and uh, just wanted to, to share a few things that have been valuable for some of my customers lately. And when I'm, you know, a lot of them come through and I say, well, you know, they ask, why should I move to cloud? Basically, um, if they just take a look at a handful of servers, it's, you know, the numbers don't really add up. When I did this math about sort of 2015 timeframe, 2014, 15, 
I really was debating with a lot of the guys on my team about whether to move or not. And when I sat down and looked at the uh, these factors, and some of them are hidden, and I'll highlight some of the hidden ones, I found them valuable, and hopefully it's valuable to you guys too if you're going through the same thought process. So some of them are obvious, right? The data center, rent and power, those are pretty obvious. The cost of one individual server, obvious. The cost of the software license, obvious. The stuff that hides that, that a lot of people don't factor in is things like ancillary equipment. So to drive that server, there's a router that's required and usually some switches to get it hooked up where you want to. Our routers, for example, were over $100,000 a piece and we were running four data centers. So that's a non-trivial cost that when I went and reallocated those costs back to each rack unit, suddenly a, you know, a server that was gonna cost $600 you know, as a one-time cost is not a one-time cost anymore. The other thing that's pretty expensive is connectivity. Um, if you really want to be connected well, and we were running SaaS applications at the time. Uh, so we had to build our own data pipe that would handle the traffic that we needed. And the last one that's also non-trivial is people. In order to have the people that are skilled to run a data center um, and, and have enough of them to operate on a 24-hour basis and not burn them out is, is not a cheap proposition. So those are, are some hidden costs that you should include in, in your calculations for sure. Um, and obviously with cloud, with cloud, you're provisioning what you need when you need it. And you're generally using more commodity hardware. You're instead of attacking a problem by perhaps using two machines with GPUs, you might use 50 machines that are, that are not run, you know, non GPU type machines to, to get the same throughput, for example. There's also, um, disaster recovery sort of piles on top of the costs. So it's not just one data center, but in, in many cases, it's two. And you need to duplicate equipment in that other one in case you actually need to fail over to it. Um, in our case, we had to do failover testing. I had to keep spare equipment on hand. Um, that's a tax that you know, a lot of people don't keep track of. And your, your data centers are generally geographically uh, disparate. So I had to fly folks to Europe and to, um, uh, and to Vegas pretty frequently as part of my budget. Uh, so when you start pooling in a lot of these things that you don't initially think of as the cost of, of uh, data center versus cloud, the, 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 you know, it can really tilt, tilt. And for us, our data center rates were going up and, our, and basically the cloud compute costs were going down. So I could see, you know, even if I was a little off on the first year, by year three, I was going to be, I was, I was going to look really good. There's another thing that popped up, which is surprise volume scenarios. Um, you know, not everybody tells you when something's going to be a hit. Um, we had a few customers in the m and space who had huge shows. Um, they, they thought they could predict what the volume was going to be for some of these premieres. And sometimes they were just dead wrong. And when you provision, you know, a data center for a certain amount of volume and you miss, it, it's, it's not a fun place to be. Um, you can really recover well in a cloud scenario and we'll, we'll get more into that. The other thing is you can add one server at a time. Um, I've been in situations before where my guys come into my office and they go, uh, cage three is, is at 90%. Um, and you, you know, you, then you got to make a decision. Do I rent another, yet another cage? And that's a lease that I have to sign for a couple of years where when you're in the cloud, it's, it's not even a discussion. A lot of things become a non-factor when you're, when you're operating in a cloud environment. So, now let's turn to, uh, to Telestream Cloud specifically. I think you, many of you know Telestream. We uh, have been developing, you know, essentially media processing tools for, for many years. We've also acquired several uh, companies and, and, and technologies that you've, you've probably all been using. Um, the, the Telestream Cloud is basically a, a toolbox for vi cloud video processing. Um, Rick said something earlier about microservices and those becoming more and more available in the cloud. From, from a perspective of somebody who's looking at a whole, whole overarching workflow of a lot of different things, we offer a collection of microservices to do very specific things. Um, and these can work together um, or can be used individually. So they include transcoding. And that's our, our sort of API-based transcoders and our Vantage Cloud port, which is basically you draw your workflows uh, visually. Uh, QC Engine, um, we'll get back to that later. 
uh, a captioning tool that uh, generates captions from a transcription, um, AI-based transcription. Stream monitoring, which watches uh, streams. Um, basically, it can be linear streams, or um, we can actually do file-based monitoring as well. And a playback service for you to view files that are very difficult to view, you know, so that you don't essentially have to download an entire massive file to view it. And I'll, I'll go through each of these in detail in a minute. So why, uh, why would somebody look at Telestream Cloud or, or a set of services like this and find them attractive? Number one, it's a comprehensive set. So you get access to an account and you have all these tools at your disposal and you can use them um, or not use them. It's, it's really up to you. They're controllable via a set of APIs. Um, the platform itself allows connection to your cloud storage. Uh, so for Amazon, for example, it could connect directly to your S3. And once you make that connection, any of the tools can see and access the media there or write to your output storage locations. And it also integrates with notification systems. So when something happens, like say, for example, a QC uh, template notices that the file doesn't match, um, it notifies the right people in your organization using you know, simple not notification system or um, some kind of pub sub or uh, there's a variety of different notification system. Cost effective, this is going back to what I was saying earlier about you know, the nature of cloud services. You, exact, you're paying for what you need. We've really worked to make it easier and easier to use. Uh, that's a, a you know, big, big part of, um, of, of why we produce the, the cloud and make it easier for people to sort of sign up, try it out. We don't require commitments, so, so it makes just basically make it easier for people to move to cloud. It's really tough to, to sort of make that first jump. Um, the technologies, you know, you're familiar with some of the foundational technologies, and this is a key one. We operate uh, on Amazon, but also on Azure, Google Cloud, IBM, Oracle Cloud, and, and a couple of other smaller players. So if you have media on multiple clouds, we can, we can access them regardless of where you are. The transcoding systems, um, they're cloud first. They're really built to process large volumes of content. We can deal with just about any format. Um, our, the underlying technology behind the cloud transcoders is really uh, the Vantage system, which has been in operation for many years. We've ported it over um, to the cloud and basically done a cloud up design on it, but used all of the uh, codex uh, support and all of the packaging support that we've been developing for years. Um, it's highly scalable and uh, and it's it's highly configurable. Vantage Cloud Port is is really nice transition product for our our Vantage install base. If you've seen pictures like this or workflows like this and you've drawn them in your organization, you can take these make minor modifications to them, upload them to the cloud and execute them in the cloud. Some of our customers have hundreds of workflows that are more complicated than this. And it gives them a really nice path to, um, to say, you know, we want to start moving some of these workflows to the cloud without having to completely recreate these in code. Uh, cloud QC. Um, you know, everybody's been talking during this discussion about uh, QC. It's it's exactly that. We own um, we own VidChecker and Aurora. Um, those are are two of the products that are in the pipe. We right now the version that's in um, that's on the cloud and available is based on VidChecker. In the summer, we will release uh, another version uh, that's in development right now that will take the best of VidChecker and Aurora and merge those two and provide uh, you know, what we think is a best in class uh, quality control tool that you can send as much content as you want. It's highly scalable um, and it, uh, it delivers the response in a handful of different formats. But programmatically, you can submit a job uh, qu query the job or be notified when it's complete, get the job results in JSON or in a PDF format. Uh, mostly JSON would be used in an API usage. Um, you, di you digest or, or basically uh, parse that JSON in 
and uh, make decisions based on what's happening there or based on the, the notifications that you've gotten. For captioning, um, it's pretty straightforward service. You submit a piece of video, we strip out the audio, send the audio to a transcription service, and we use two right now. One is from IBM and one is from Google, uh, depending on kind of which one operates better for, for your needs. Um, it creates that, <clears throat> creates that text that's timed according to your video. Uh, you can make modifications to it, and then you can either download it through the UI or from the API in a variety of different formats that, uh, that, are, that are compatible in different systems. The playback service is interesting. It's to address some needs that arose during uh, COVID. A lot of people were working from home. They don't have the bandwidth available to, uh, to view files, but... Uh, you know, the file length says it's 72 minutes, but the meta metadata says it's supposed to be 75 minutes. And you're wondering, is this just a chopped off file with the right file? Or am I looking at season two, episode one, instead of season one, episode two? You can actually jump in, take a look, make sure the media is what you think it is, or it's organized the way you think it is, is organized. Um, and then you can scrub through it. Um, it is done behind the scenes using... Uh, essentially our Vantage Transcoder, which is creating um, a, a playable, a browser playable proxy uh, on demand. So, you know, as you're watching it, it is, it is dynamically creating that proxy and then it's just throwing it away. So if you scrub to the end or, or you go watch first minute, middle minute, last minute, that's three minutes. And that's, that's all you, uh, that's all you're downloading. Stream monitoring is a, a little bit of a different uh, tool for us. Up until now, all the ones I've been talking through are, are in file-based workflows. This one uh, was an interesting technology. It's basically taking some of our IneoQuest technology and, and putting it in the cloud. And it allows companies like, let's say you're an event company or you're, you're the operations guy responsible for keeping an OTT service up and running. Um, I've had that role before. Uh, it's, you know, you need tools like this to help you watch what's happening amongst all of your different streams or all of your different um, uh, assets. And if you are international, you want to know that your whole system is performing uh, in a variety of different locations, not just in one or two. So this allows you to de deploy dynamically clients when you want. Um, and you can choose a, from 80 different cloud regions, um, anywhere there's really a, a major cloud provider, you can spin up a resource there. And you can either do that as an event, so you can spin it up at 8 p.m. and spin it down at 10 p.m., or you can leave them running for long periods of time. Uh, essentially, your, your team would set, your DevOps team would probably set this up and give your uh, knock a, a view of this that they can watch to make sure that everything is green and good. Uh, and then if there are notifications coming out of it, your knock gets notified, you can notify the correct DevOps team. And the way we notify the correct team is uh, by looking at multiple points along the network. So if you look at these stars right here, this is your typical kind of direct consumer workflow. You've got some kind of content acquisition happening in a live environment, going to a linear encoder, that linear encoder passes to packagers, uh, to origin servers. So we can measure at the origination point or a contribution point. We can measure at the origin servers and we can measure after the CDN or multiple CDNs, which is often common now. So let's say your CDN um, in the east is red and your CDN in the west is green and your origin's green and your um, and your contribution is green, then you know your your you know your playbook can say in that scenario your knock needs to call your your east um, CDN provider and to make sure that your system is steering traffic all to your west CDN provider, for example, or your blue or green or whatever you want to call them. But it gives you a very the the idea behind this whole system is to make sure that one you can quantitatively uh, assess the quality of your system so that you can respond to customer you know, requests. And number two, notify 
very quickly uh, before your customers notice, hopefully, that there is an issue and get that information and the debug information into your team's hands as quickly as possible to let them react. Uh, this is this is a sort of a typical OTT blueprint. Uh, you've got sources, um, some kind of aggregation and syndication system here where you're bringing in your VOD files and normalizing them or um, you know, looking at your, uh, your aggregation of your linear files. It generally goes to some kind of ingest point. You transcode it into the right number. In, in this case, it would probably be an ABR ladder. Uh, that ABR ladder, it lands in origin storage, either packaged or just as a set of um, sort of intermediate format files. Um, they'll either be statically packaged there or dynamically pass through your CDNs on the way to the players. So the places where our cloud provides solutions for this environment is monitoring at the edge, uh, transcoding of, of VOD and live, and of um, mainly live to VOD, by the way, um, and of the ingest and normalization and QC of VOD content and monitoring the, uh, monitoring the linear feeds. The entire uh, cloud services set is documented, you know, and, and we have a full set of uh, documentation that includes the ability to get started using curl commands and actually try the commands from within our documents so that you can grab that and recodify it into whatever uh, language you are, are using and make it as easy as possible. A little glimpse into uh, what we've done recently and some things that are coming. Um, a couple of additions in, in December, the contribution monitoring stream, which I mentioned. Another major one is uh, we can do ad monitoring now uh, in our monitoring tool to make sure that your, that your SCUDI 35 markers are in the right place and appearing as they should. If they are not there, you can't insert ads and you're basically missing revenue, which is pretty huge. Um, we also added some accelerated transcoding for, uh, for ABR jobs. We have a new service coming out in this quarter called Transform. It is basically a next generation of our cloud transcoder. Uh, it pulls in a lot of the functionality from Vantage, but exposes um, really deep at, at a really deep level the API and the ability to make um, programmatic usage of of what was hidden behind a lot of the Vantage workflow stuff. So this is really a uh, a a, a Vantage style transcoder built for developer type um, operators or not operators, but developer type folks. Our playback service is also uh, launching this, uh, this quarter. I mentioned that one already and I have mentioned already this one as well. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's all I had. I'll save the rest for if there's any, uh, any questions because I've got about a minute and a half left. Yes, Alex, there was a uh, question that came up uh, regarding your uh, playback tool. Mm -hmm. uh, and is it, this is from Ian, is it um, possible to uh, also use VLC? So VLC, I have used it in the past. And generally what I do is I download the media to my, um, you know, to my laptop and I bring up VLC and I take a look at it. Um, the you know, if you want to create a cloud um, server and, and um, if you wanted to create a cloud server, run VLC in the cloud, you'd at least avoid having the egress charges coming out of that cloud environment, but you still have to deal with that transfer time of moving it from the S3 location to, to that server. I have I'm not sure if S3, if VLC can play directly from object storage. I know it can play from mounted storage. This whereas is, your, yeah, whereas your player is playing directly from S3 storage. That's exactly right. It is literally right. playing directly. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it'll play formats like, you know, JPEG 2000, MXF, like things, you know, things that are, you know, things that are not easily playable um, even with, even with these types of players. So thank you. And mm -hmm. um, next we're um, moving on to uh, Evan and Liam from uh, Amazon Web Services and um, take it away. I just called this play out in distribution ideas because I don't want, you know, 
I don't want people to think there's only one way to do something. I just saw a question, you know, for OTT, are there different ways or does everybody pretty much do the same thing? I was talking earlier today with um, Thomas Edwards, who I'm sure a lot of people on this call know, and uh, we kind of said all the customers for the most part are trying to get to the same end state, which is make reliable video happen. But um, you know, if you talk to 10 different customers, they'll give you 10 different ideas about how they wanna get there. So there actually is quite a bit of variability. I just, I'll walk through this really quickly because uh, there's a little bit of a story behind it. And I know some people have seen some similar slides already, but I, I thought I would tell the story behind it because uh, this didn't come to be like overnight or anything. It happened because a lot of customers asked a lot of questions. So basically from left to right, what we're looking at here is uh, pretty much a system that is a playout system where on the left side is a contribution stream and on the right side is a, a few distribution streams. And uh, there's a few different codecs called out here and there's a few different transports called out here. But one of the things that I like to mention is that we're trying to pick the right tool for the job. And when I say the job, I mean, you know, the particular thing that a customer is looking to do, because for example, in this diagram, we show JPEG XS, which has, you know, very good latency profile. And we're looking at uh, SMPTE 2110 uh, and 2022-7 with path merging and stuff like that. That's these sort of hourglass crossover shaped things. Um, and this is really great for when you need low latency with the highest quality possible and you're doing live, you know, sports or something like that. Um, but, you know, there's other tools in the toolbox, if you will, like Wrist or SRT or Zixi. And uh, yeah, they add a little bit of latency, but, you know, if you're doing a playout channel that is playing out, uh, you know, files from S3 or something instead of live content, then that's probably fine. So I always encourage customers when they ask, you know, how how do you do this? Well, it really, it depends. And you have to get in the weeds about what's right for the particular workflow you're doing so that you don't accidentally overcomplicate things or spend too much money or something like that. Um, so that's one thing to know. The other thing is on the right side of this diagram um, where we're looking at distribution, you notice that there's satellite uplinks and there's CDN distribution. And so, uh, I don't know, for those who are familiar, sorry for repeating, for those not, uh, Media Live is the AWS service that does uh, linear video encoding. And it has a StatMux feature, so you can create a StatMux for your, uh, for your uplink. Uh, and at the same time, you can output to a packager and create HLS and dash. And then um, that's what the media package thing is. And then the media tailor thing is the add inserter uh, service. So um, the thing that's interesting here, cause it seems sort of obvious when you think about it, like, yeah, you encode once and distribute twice, but actually that wasn't, that wasn't the original uh, diagram in any way. Um, when I first started at AWS five years ago, most customers actually had a different encoder for their primary screen distribution versus their internet distribution. And one of the first asks that we got was, how do I, how do I converge this? I think that, you know, the common term was converged head end. So how do I manage my encoding farm in one place instead of two? And so this was born out of that. Um, and then, you know, the other story with JPEG XS and CDI came from, and how do I do it with the least latency possible? Because, um, you know, then once we had encoding in the cloud and we had this direct connect that you could pull back to your uplink, that was pretty much what Discovery was doing a few years ago and, and are still doing, uh, by the way. But, um, people said, well, that's great. How do we build on that to make it lower latency so that it works for live applications? And so we ended up with this JPEG XS CDI combo. And again, I wanna emphasize, this is just one way to do it. There are other codecs uh, for lots of customers. JPEG 2000 is plenty fast for some customers. Um, 
you know, there's like low latency H.264 and HEVC options that they say are low latency enough because it's a trade off between uh, latency and bandwidth, I guess, at some point. Um, and then in between instances in the cloud, we came up with CDI because uh, as as Chris and Joe were alluding to earlier, customers wanted to be able to avoid encoding and decoding at every hop in the chain within the cloud and share their frames across instances. Uh, if you're curious to learn more about how that works, feel free to connect with me or Google AWS CDI. It's open source. Um, I'm not going to do the CDI presentation today. But, um, but the idea here was that you could get the end-to-end -end system working in just a few frames back and forth so that um, the operators could run in the cloud effectively without taking on additional delay. Uh, and then, of course, the last piece that I'll mention is this box that says multi-view, which is the traditional multi-viewer. So you would see this multi-view box uh, in, you know, if you had like 10 different channels, you might have the same multi-view instance uh, represented um, across all the channels, and then you know you're creating a. I don't know why I picked ten. I should have picked nine. Nice square number, huh? Uh, a nine split, if you will. And um, and in this way, you can just bring back your your multi-view return instead of bringing back the full um, the full roster of all nine or ten of those channels. And the reason to do that essentially is to uh, to save money. So the way that people are thinking about this is pull back the multi-viewers with JPEG XS because that's super low latency. Uh, and then if needed, pull back the full raster like in a by exception type basis. So you could create an alarm, for example, that would, um, you know, if you think about the way that a penalty box works for multi-viewers today, you could create an alarm uh, that would essentially trigger the full raster play app to be sent back via, um, JPEG access or something like that so that you could get full raster. Okay, enough on this one. The next one is sort of an expansion on um, how to get stuff in and out of the cloud. So the, the next thing customers said was, this is all well and good, but uh, how do I get stuff in and out? I need to bring in feeds from stadiums and I need to uh, give stuff to meet me room partners, so to speak. Like I don't necessarily want to bring it I don't want to do my play out in the cloud only to have to bring it back on-prem when I want to just give it to somebody else who's already in the cloud. So um, this is a, an idea, like I said, all ideas. This is an idea of how to do that. Um, we do have direct connects with a few of the popular network providers such as, um, such as the Switch and uh, why am I, uh, Lumen. I was blanking on their new name. You know, the old CenturyLink Vivix people. Um, and so there are ways to book feeds directly into Media Connect uh, or, or your own EC2 instance or you're directly into your playout, whatever you want, um, just by calling those partners. And then you can uh, hand off IP in the cloud. And this is just an, a way to do that where you're handing off at each step in the chain, depending on what your partner wants. Um, the next thing that we got asked about and somebody actually asked, uh, I think it was coming out of a Simpty meeting a couple of weeks ago, somebody asked, well, what do you do if you're a stations group and you're taking a network feed and you wanna create station feeds? How do you do that in the cloud? And, and so the idea here is basically if your network playout is in the cloud, suppose you are uh, Fox um, who's doing their playout in the cloud, suppose you're Fox and, uh, you you are able to hand off via the Meet Me Room concept we were just talking about uh, to your various station partners that are supposed to be downstream of you. Traditionally, you would do that with satellite, but as more of the station groups want to consolidate their operations into one place and sort of gain efficiencies of scale by running in one place instead of you know running disparate footprints all over the country, you could imagine that you could have a fan out like this where uh, the stations group would own the station playout instances, uh, one per you know DMA or something like that, however you want to break them up, whatever is appropriate, um, and then have an edge receiver at the transmitter, um, kind of like this. This is a sorry. So this view is 
I guess from the network perspective, how you would fan it out to many stations. And then this view is what it might look like to a station, I think. So, um, you know, you might just have a limited footprint at the station somewhere and you'd have a small encoder. We have one called the, the link that you can order through the AWS console. But basically you could connect your studio to that or you could send that to like a, you know, reporter's house, like if, if because of COVID or something like that, they're doing the news remotely. This works over a standard internet connection pretty much. And uh, you could use that to get your live content into the cloud to your station playout. And then what your station playout uh, service in the middle is doing is essentially switching between the network playout and the local playout. And then uh, we just sort of put in the sub-channel idea. The sub-channel is for those who don't know, uh, a lot of times, actually, how do I explain this to people who don't know? I never thought about it. Um, if you're at home, you might see channel like 4.0 and then you hit up on your remote and you see 4.1 and 4.2. Those are usually sub-channels that are muxed into the same ATSC carrier. And um, those sub-channels need to be played out just the same usually. So you'd have your main station play out and then you'd have your sub-channel uh, playing out. Usually the subchannels don't have as many live components or sometimes none at all. So it's usually a simple thing to play out and then you can mux them together. But really the point here is that um, you, the, the point here is that customers are interested in having as few stuff at the station itself as possible to maintain. So you could just have a sending device on the left and you could have a receiving device on the right and your receiver over here connects to your modulator. And then naturally somebody said, well, what do we do about ATSC3? So, um, so we put this together. I won't necessarily walk through the whole diagram, but I can share the deck with everybody afterwards. But the idea is that you could use a combination of core services and the suite of software services necessary to create ATSC3 compliant signals uh, in the cloud and then essentially send them via direct connector internet to that edge receiver where you would connect it to the exciter chain. Um, that's all the slides I had. I think that was a reasonable overview of how linear TV works in the cloud today. We do have one question here from uh, Marwan, okay. which is, um, does, uh, J is JSX uh, CDI, a Amazon service. I think that was in your, one of your previous slides. Yes. It's, uh, not yet. What do you mean by not yet? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> what I mean by is I, I think they're looking at it. That's, uh, it for the question. So, uh, let's bring, uh, Liam on. Uh, yes. Liam's going to talk about, uh, machine learning and image processing today. So. Happy to hand it over, Liam. Thank you, Evan. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about something pretty left turny from, from this, but I wanna talk about using machine learning for video processing. Uh, so I'm gonna really quickly and not subject everyone to probably what you've seen in every single machine learning deck ever, which is the definitions of machine learning, artificial intelligence and deep learning. Uh, think of them as nested with AI being the general uh, concept, machine learning being a subset, and then deep learning being a subset of that. Uh, but in the interest of time, I wanted to talk about where ML is heading and, and where it is starting to affect all areas of media and entertainment, which is my focus as a, as a solutions architect at AWS. Uh, so it's turning from kind of people playing with it to, to very specific use cases. Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of them, but I'm going to focus specifically on media processing um, use cases. Uh, so machine learning for video understanding is actually probably one of the more commonly talked about use cases. Uh, an example would be what C-SPAN is doing, which is uh, actually something I think Rick mentioned very early on in the presentation tonight around having a frame-by-frame -frame understanding of your content. So having a second-by-second frame-by-frame understanding what's being said, making uh, asset libraries searchable. Uh, down to the frame and, and who's in what, what's being talked about. This is actually a very popular area. We have a lot of partners. Uh, we have a lot of technology uh, from transcribe recognition that can help in this space. Uh, that's not what I wanted to talk about tonight. I wanted to talk about uh, using machine learning for video processing, which is uh, a bit more of a cutting edge area, a lot more where research is happening and not as many 
um, productized features, but you're starting to see them come out. But I wanted to kind of go into the underlying technology that goes into these concepts. Um, so we'll talk about two use cases, but there's actually way more to talk about. And I want to talk about um, how AWS provides a framework that allows anyone that can kind of experiment with these. Um, what I'll be talking about is research and open source work that that is not AWS. It's actually out in the community, but it's available for use and and working uh, doing these type of things. So super resolution is the first thing I want to talk about, which is the concept of creating a high resolution output from a low resolution input. So historically, this is done with geometrical or statistical methods. Uh, where it's now moving is deep learning, which can improve by learning from lots of training data, which would be high resolution images that were downscaled. And then the model would seek to uh, increase the resolution. Um, learning from temporal data. So moving into video, you can actually gain a lot of information from the temporal information in the frames that can be used for super resolution. So motion data to, to understand. Um, and finally, using generative techniques uh, which if we talked about the original concept of taking a high resolution image and lowering it, generative AI is the concept of, of having a, a generator and a discriminator, which the generator seeks to, re to increase the resolution and the discriminator uh, essentially critiques it and it iterates that in the machine learning model. Um, the use cases, I actually had a bunch of these and I kind of turned them all back into upscaling because that, you know, modernizing content, matching frame rate, matching, resolu matching uh, resolution, all files under the same thing of upscaling, which as you know, has been around for a very long time outside of machine learning. So I'm gonna show one uh, paper demo, um, but the, the thing here is I took this code from GitHub. It's actually out there for anyone. I have the uh, paper here if you wanna read the details and the code here if you want to actually seek to implement it. This is not specific to AWS. Uh, what I did is I took it into our SageMaker framework, which allowed me to use the uh, high, highly, highly needed GPU backed instances to do this at a high speed. Um, so when talking about video, you have to do this on every frame and the latency of get passing it to a machine learning model and returning it is, is high. So the more power you have in a GPU helps in both training and inference. So uh, this one is wide activation for efficient and accurate uh, image resolution or super resolution. Um, WDSR, another very commonly used one is SuperGAN, which is a super resolution generative uh, network. Um, so here's a demo and I'll, and I'll show this in the, in the notebook in a little bit. Um, but this is a very low resolution image that I use just standard methods to raise the resolution. Uh, so you can see here highly pixelated. Uh, and if you look uh, using cubic uh, upscaling, you get a very blurry image, but higher resolution. I then used uh, the WDSR uh, methodology to do the same image, which actually, if you look here, has as much higher resolution. Uh, this data came out of this image. There was nothing more to what you see here than what you see on the left. Um, so again, WDSR is, is one of the more recent methods, but uh, the cool thing about the deep learning space is every year, more papers, more research, and more methodologies to do each of these things happen. So um, it, it, it's a very fast moving space. Moving over to uh, the next area, which is frame interpolation. So video frame interpolation inter in, intends to synthesize non-existent frames in between the original frames. Uh, so deep learning techniques actually improve the accuracy of the interpolated frames by understanding things like blurring, uh, motion, uh, depth. Um, so I'll go into that. So some of the use cases here are slow motion generation. So taking a, a fast move, you know, 24 frames and turning it into a slow motion video. Um, also smoothing out of, of animation, stop motion animation, um, increasing the frame rates, frame recovery. Novel view synthesis, which is very popular for VR, which is kind of creating a, a, a slightly skewed view from uh, frames that already exist. So I want to go into a demo of that. For that, I'm going to show uh, depth aware video frame interpolation, um, often referred to as Dane. So this is a very specific methodology for frame interpolation. This is the paper. 
this is the code. Um, there's there's a lot of really cool use cases. There's one specific to anime, one specific to stop motion. Um, but I'm going to show just a, a quick demo I built um, using the Dane model, and then we'll go into how I did that. Um, so I have here just a, a video that I got at 24 or 25 frames a second. It was the original. Let me. Go to the original. So here's the original, 25 frames a second, no more, no less. Uh, and then I ran it through Dane and generated 120 frames per second. I um, mean, this I did very quickly. Um, if I had some, if I had more data specific, I could probably improve this. But just to show what's going on here is essentially for every one frame I interpolated, I believe eight or nine frames um, pending. Um, using the depth aware frame interpolation methodology. Again, just to be clear, Dane and WDSR super again, these are not AWS. This is code on GitHub that is openly freely available to anyone. Um, but you're starting to see these technologies implemented in uh, many different media use cases. So how to get there, uh, to do that, we used uh, SageMaker, which I won't go into all of this, but the key thing is at AWS, we have a lot of different tools and concepts to speed people's time to market with machine learning. So starting at the very bottom, which is a core thing that I used, which is our framework support and our GPUs. So one thing to note is these research papers, uh, the people building this uh, code and content, they, they have preferences. And as you get deeper into this, you'll likely find preferences, whether you love TensorFlow, whether you use PyTorch, um, or who knows what's coming next. So one of the goals of SageMaker and our ML support in general is to support as many different frameworks as possible as customers need. Um, so I'll show an example of TensorFlow and an example of PyTorch, uh, also using the GPUs. Um, so the, the heavy lifter here, um, which you also might know from some video processing use cases, is the, the GPU-backed instance, the G4, uh, which is our one of our current uh, GPU-backed instances that you can spin up on demand as needed from very small to very large uh, capacity for both GPUs and CPU and memory. So, uh, use cases, I'm sure you're familiar with the video processing use cases, but also high speed AI ML, also AR, VR. Um, so what I used here was SageMaker. I'm gonna pop in very quickly. I wanna make sure we keep on time for everyone. So what I did here is I, I brought the code from GitHub for Dane and for the WDSR model and built it, I essentially had to add a couple of things specific to make it work in SageMaker, install the TensorFlow add-ons. This is a TensorFlow model. And uh, just import some things specific so I could use S3 and reference different things. Um, once I did that, I ran the model, trained the model um, as you would. And uh, I'll do another demo just to give you an idea. You can uh, do this frame by frame. Um, there is implementations of this that actually do it on a whole video. So this is a low res of my picture, which I then generated a higher res uh, output from. Um, similarly, this is how I built the, uh, the Dane content as well. And in here, if you look, you're using FFmpeg to pull the, the frames apart and inter interpolate the new frames and then put the, put the video back together at the new higher frame rate. Now bringing this all together and then we'll head over to questions. Um, this is a common, you might've seen this on the internet. This is a common, uh, let's full screen this, a common use case. And this actually uses Dane, but also super resolution. This is using all of these concepts in one combined video. There's also some more uh, techniques for smoothing. Um, but what you see here is it actually takes, um, and, I might not do this in, uh, I, uh, I'm gonna try that again because I love how I do a demo without the net in code. And then the one thing that fails me is the YouTube playback of a video. Um, let me try that again. Here, I have it in a different video. 
Yeah, this should work. I won't I won't uh, full screen it that way this time. But this is available for anyone to try to view. This is up on YouTube. What they did is they took a very old video, and this is not something I did. This was done uh, by Dennis here, uh, but it turns a old video into a let me down that into 4k and uh 60 frames a second so um there's many other use cases of of this but it involves both uh super resolution and frame interpolation at the same time so with that i will turn it over for questions i definitely want to thank everyone for their time tonight as well all right, thank you. Uh, this was very interesting. So one of the questions we have, and we're going to put this to the entire panel and we can discuss it. When you migrate a TV infrastructure to the cloud, what are the biggest problems that come up? I would say operational change management has been our biggest challenge. In terms of what, engineering or operations or? Operations, you know, operations. we, yep, yep. You know, we architect an environment, right? And, you know, we try as hard as we can to mimic the on the ground experience, right? You know, let, let, let's try to build, you know, as close to what the quote unquote traditional master control environment, you know, has been like, but it's different. Um, when the equipment is not in the same room, when you're managing, you know, perhaps a linear, you know, play out channel from an AWS workspace, you know, versus a traditional, you know, automation front end with, you know, many screens and you're inside a traditional broadcast hub, there are workflow differences. And a lot of those workflows have been in place for, you know, 30 years or, or, or more, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. some on the, some of the attendees will, will recognize, you know, we've been on this journey with them, right? And, 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 you know, the challenges are very real. So, you know, when we, when we, when we enter into these types of customer engagements, we really try to start to address that up front. you know, what's going to change, what needs to change, and that, helps us drive to a better result. Yeah, do you think the, the change from tape-based playout to server-based playout was, was more severe or less severe? Um, I think it was less severe, but I'll take that as a qualified you know, answer. And I'm sure that there'll be the share of dis disagreement in the room. Um, yeah. You know, I think that was more an engineering change, you know, versus an operational change, but I, I'm certainly open for debate on that point. Yeah. Rick, do you have any comment on that, being that you're in the operations business? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that, that's correct, right? It's, it's, it's just the whole fact that, you know, you have people who are, are so used to having the, the CTA right next door, the equipment there where they can touch it, reboot it, et cetera. Um, that that's the the key differentiator, I think, from a from an operator perspective when they're actually managing it. I, I I think it's 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 pretty similar. Anyone else have a comment or? We have another question uh, from Josh, who, uh, how big are the variables between uh, workflow designs? For example, are all the OTT VOD uh, platform designs basically the same? I think I can take that one. There, if, you, if you look at a high level architecture diagram, they're all almost the same. When you look at how people put together those parts and what's inside those things, they're different. So the way they, you know, they, I mean, there's, there's one sort of easy path if you're building from the back to front. Everybody has a CDN of some kind. Um, but behind that, the, how you store the media uh, on the origin can either be dynamically packaged or statically packaged. So that's one decision point. And then from there, you go backwards. There's a bunch more about what formats do you deliver to where... Um, how do you produce those formats? And it just, you know, what's, what do you start with? What media type do you, do you begin with? Um, um, do you 
Do you QC as part of the workflow or do you just release the files and make that asynchronous and recall the media if it fails? There's a lot of different ways, but all the same steps almost always apply. When you look at them, they all end up looking like ingest, you know, process, store, and then some kind of distribution mechanism with, with the same players, it's payment um, um, or advertising. And then the, uh, the encryption modules, like the same players are always present. The metadata has to live somewhere and be accessible by the apps. The apps have to be there. So, um, you know, all the diagrams basically look the same. They just have different, different means of operation. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I completely uh, I also... concur with that. But you first, please. Uh, uh, I was going to agree also. So <laughs> I was I was going to add that there's different tiers though, like the like the most complex diagram is the superset of the more simple versions of it. Like I'll give an example, um, you might not have an OTT distributable that needs dynamic ad insertion, so you just take like the big diagram and you'd be like, okay, and then you delete the dynamic ad insertion part, um, or you might not have a channel that needs blackouts, but then you might have a sports channel over here that needs all kind of weird schedule manipulation stuff going on. And then, so you're just yep. adding or subtracting modules from the overall workflow, depending on the customer's need. The simplest is probably free VOD without encryption. <laughs> There's no subscription. You just, you just can watch the video. That's like the basic pipeline and all these other things are like, managing subscribers, managing access control, authentication, authorization, all, and like you said, ad revenue, measurement, all that kind of stuff gets, gets bolted on. Then we have another question from Josh. Uh, <clears throat> when designing cloud workflows, what are the main causes of latency? When, uh, when fighting latency, what are the trade-offs? Joe and I both answered that question. Um, I'll answer it verbally though, for people who aren't reading. The yeah. way I think about latency. That's why I'm reading these. Because yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Not everybody has visibility to them. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the way I think about latency in the cloud or really any system is um, the right balance of uh, latency with cost with reliability for your particular application. And so uh, I'll, if, you, if you don't care about latency, that's called VOD. I, I would say on the like super long tail, it, it becomes not live anymore. It becomes VOD right. and you're downloading a file. You don't care about latency at all. On the other end of that spectrum is uh, you care about latency so much that you don't want any protocols in the way that do retransmissions, which is called UDP. And along with that, this spectrum all the way on the right side, which is VOD is like super reliable because you're downloading a file and you don't care when it ends versus the other side of UDP, which is like super unreliable because sometimes packets go missing. So you, you, first of all, you have to pick where on that line you want your application to be for your content. Um, so like if you're sports, you're super latency sensitive, you're probably closer to the UDP side totally. And then you're like, okay, well, how much money do I want to spend on this? So then you have to decide if you want it to be low latency and reliable or low latency and not reliable. So you can have low latency and not reliable using UDP packets. And, you know, you'll notice that your latencies are measured in milliseconds and everybody's happy until the packets don't get there. Um, so then if you want super low latency, but more expensive, or I should say, but more reliable, then it costs a little more. And that's where tools like 2022-7 come where you send all of the UDP packets over diverse paths. And you know if one packet goes missing on one side, then on the other side, it's statistically improbable that you would lose the same packet at the same time. Mm -hmm. And thus you can have ultra low latency with um, ultra high reliability. It just it just costs a little more. Awesome. So you have to you have to tune all those things in for your particular workflow uh, to get it right. Yeah, and whether you, what a latency you can tolerate all depends on where you are in that workflow. It does, and it's also up to the customer themselves a little bit. Like each customer, if you go across and you poll ten different customers, what's the acceptable latency for the, this kind of thing? 
you you'll get 10 different answers i guarantee like some people will just be really unclear and say no it has to be instant which is totally unrealistic because nothing is truly instant um and then you'll have some people say they don't care and then you'll have some people that'll be like two seconds five seconds seven seconds and it's just like you know it's not one size fits all you, you got to ask this question of your customers for the certain workflow and then tune it right yeah what um <clears throat> What uh, is the prospect for being able to uh, process audio and mix audio in the cloud? Is there anyone doing that now? Uh, what do you mean by mix? Uh, yeah, uh, I agree. I'd argue that Zoom is doing it right now in real time. Everybody's well, mix, watching I it. A, I have a mixing control surface where all the processing is done in the cloud and there's an operator using the control surface. Uh, there's no reason why not. I just haven't seen somebody build a, a software-based method that, that runs on EC2. I, I can't well, think I of any Evan, reason why not. You know, if we look at, you know, you know, Sony and some others are starting to virtualize production switchers, right? You know, there are right. cloud-based. So it, it feels like that's just a subset of, of, of that, right? Sort of. Um, yeah, yeah, yes and no. Again, this is like now that we move into this software world and people can do all kinds of things, like the, the barrier to entry into the market for technology providers is lower because anybody can write some software modules. You get really into this like, well, you know, we can do it for tier three where we want to keep the cost low. But, you know, if, you, if I want to make 20 audio stems for live sports, then that A1 mixer still wants that feedback right away that he touches a fader like right. it's almost like latency is even more sensitive yeah. for audio than it is for video so yeah it's all about like, it's all about use case right? right yeah, yeah what, what, exactly. what is audio is it, it zoom is audio mixing is it live events audio mixing are we making a high-end record for taylor swift you know audio mixing takes on many many forms and you know how, how do we solve for the use cases funny enough the high-end record for taylor swift is probably easier to do because yeah. right. you get to use pro your... tools or something and just keep hitting play yeah. until you get it right but right. yeah yeah it's sort of in your vod category yeah a little bit yeah it's not real time uh, we have another question from Nathaniel. Uh, how long does it take to train ML models for uh, upconverting or transcoding? Are, <clears throat> are those microservices or they, do they spin up uh, instances to run uh, software that way? So the, the unfortunate answer you probably get when talking about the cloud a lot is it, it depends. Um, which is which is what what I say far too often. Uh, but but the truth is the the training of these models uh, can be significantly long, like hours to days. Again, it, the training is depending on how much horsepower you have behind the training. Um, what I was showing was actually the inference, which is faster than training by far. That's the prediction. So think of inference as all the work that goes into what makes the prediction. Um, but the inference is still not as fast as you're gonna probably want for real-time video for some of these deep, deeply complex models, these deep learning models. Mm -hmm. um, so the inference can be done much quicker. The inference can be done in the triple digit milliseconds to higher, but that's where like the processing depends on how complex the model is and how much GPU horsepower and CPU and memory you have behind it. Um, so it definitely varies by the model, uh, but depending on if it's not, uh, you know, a, a GAN-based deep learning model, it might be quicker. Um, there, there's kind of the AWS adage of, of test, 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 or, or kind of benchmark everything, uh, but it can be done quicker. Um, the, the inference for, for instance, the WSR image inference that I was doing was along the lines of, of like 100 milliseconds, 90 milliseconds. Uh, however, the frame interpolation uh, when I used the low power instance, took about an hour uh, for the five second video that I showed. Mm. Uh, when I used the higher power instance, I got it down to about 25 minutes, uh, which cost me significantly more for a small, far, far shorter amount of time. Um, so it, it, I hate to say it depends over and over again, but uh, it definitely but it does depends. depend. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And we do see people using microservices for inference, specifically around things like object detection, things that are lighter weight. We even have the ability to push models down on-prem with the, the model, mon model manager and, and uh, the panorama device. So uh, happy to dig into this more. If you want to uh, find me on LinkedIn, I can, I can go yeah. for hours on this topic. <laughs> uh, I have another question for you. <clears throat> Could a version of your technology be used for restoring old music recordings? Yes. Uh, well, and, and, and from, to be uh, clear, yeah, yeah, and and I posted a uh, a paper that that is up on Arxiv, which is one of the uh, main paper uh, repositories. Um, this concept is being used often for uh, audio super resolution, which is not. I don't know if I agree with the terminology, but they kind of extended the deep learning methodologies for image to audio. I mean, I want to be clear, this is not AWS tech, this is industry research that's out there. So what I posted mm -hmm. was was from someone in the in the research space that did some really cool work on audio super resolution. Um, however, we do have an audio component with, uh, we launched a, a way to learn generative AI for music with, uh, it's called the Deep Composer. And essentially allows you to play a simple uh, pattern on a piano, and then it will use generative AI to provide drums, guitar, bass, um, very similar concepts of creating um, things where, where nothing was based on training data. So it uses Wait. generative AI to uh, Now we can create it. the Taylor Swift record. This is awesome, Liam. I don't know about this. <laughs> can, you, can you provide a link to that? I'm sure I, I'm, I'm personally yes. interested in seeing what happens if I play a lick on my keyboard, what comes out of this thing. <laughs> it actually uses any MIDI funky. keyboard, um, but the but the Deep Composer is a keyboard that you can use. I'll post a link in the, we actually, uh, the launch was about a year and change ago and it had Jonathan Colton playing a a, a song about AI and then it provided all the oh. backing. So I, I, will, I will put it in here as well. There's a lot of crossover between the TV space and musicians. There's probably a ton of people on here right now being like, ah, let's see. <laughs> so Ed, I, I had a question for, um, for Rick and maybe some of the other folks. Um, I, my question revolves around how, how widespread uh, the use of IMF is. And, and the reason for my question and, and, and it really took me by surprise um, my wife and I have sort of been watching this uh, series on, on Netflix that stars um, an actor who just changed their name recently. If you, if you saw the news a few weeks ago, Ellen Page changed her name to become Elliot Page, now his name. And uh, on a series that um, uh, they star on, the credits have switched uh, since um, she changed her name to his name. And uh, it was it really surprised me because when the credits popped up, it said Elliot Page instead of Ellen Page, where it had before. Is that um, a, a, an a artifact of um, of IMF? And are more and more companies uh, adopting that specifically so they get that flexibility and they can update their content without having to? Uh, yeah, back and yeah, definitely, them. especially on Netflix, right? Because they're IMF based, right? So it was probably a supplemental redelivery of just the frames with that credit in it, right? That was updated, right? So it was it was sending a, a small number of frames versus sending out assets to all of their, you know, cash to delivery points globally. So an IMF is just more and more, you know, becoming prevalent, especially with a lot of the larger studios as well as a container format. You obviously you got the DPP, version in the UK and Europe and Simti over here. So over the last year, I think more and more people are embracing the IMF and Netflix is really pushing that to become the de facto standard, I think. And then I'm seeing a lot of other OTT platforms or large cable operators um, internationally that are looking saying, hey, we need to change the way we host and manage all this cash content we have when it's in license for us. And IMF seems to be the thing that they're, they're trying to embrace to do that. We're, you know, we're seeing a lot, at a lot in Telestream and a lot of people asking about IMF support in the cloud. Yeah. And you guys create them now in Telestream too, don't yeah. you? Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. you see it in Adobe, uh, Avid, most of these applications are, are being able to create the, the IMF packages. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also see a broader adoption, certainly. Yeah. And, I, you know, Netflix wants TIFF sequences now, right? They want the extreme highest res frame that you can give to them. And that's what I was trying to hint on earlier in my, in my presentation was store everything in the highest resolution that you have it, but store, you know, just one frame, right? You don't have duplicate frames of the same frame in your storage architecture because um, the, the cost of storage and the, and the version control and all that just gets unwieldy, especially when you're, when you're in the cloud. Um, and I, I think that's where the true benefits come in. We've seen when we've moved archives to the cloud using IMF, we've seen a reduction of 60 to 70 percent of the storage footprint that they've had. It pays for itself. Question for um, Chris, uh, how do you see the traditional roles evolving? For example, roles, uh, br rolling breaks and uh, production control from any uh, any other examples? That's from Jesse. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, you know, one of the goals, you know, we look at when, you know, we're, we're, we're working on cloud migration is, you know, trying to automate human tasks, right? So the roles do change and let me just minimize this, sorry. The roles do change and, you know, the roles do shift. I'm going to ask Joe to speak to that in the, the production, you know, control um, um, context because he's, he's, he's better at it, but it really does speak to, you know, how I, how I started the, the, the first question, right? You know, the change management element and the way operational, you know, rules and, and workflows do change when you, when, when you, when you, when you start a migration to cloud is, is critically important, right? So Joe, why don't you speak to, you know, kind of the production centric element of that? Because I think you are closer to that piece of it than I am. Um, so I think the question was, you know, operationally, what kind of things change when we move into the cloud environment and what that really looks like from the operator perspective. Um, I can tell you from our first launch deployment, um, the uh, operationally, it stayed sort of similar. I'm sorry, my cat wants dinner. Um, it, it, it stayed pretty similar in, in, in that, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said earlier with, with using workspaces, we were able to bring the virtual desktops to the NOC and we were able to bring the virtual multi-viewer to the NOC. So we sort of just recreated the NOC um, on-prem, right, um, from the cloud. And we don't have to do that anymore, right? All of these operations can be run completely independently from home from these workspace environments. So right there, we're looking at a completely different paradigm in the actual operator use of the platform and that they could pick up, you know, a laptop, walk away from the NOC and take it on vacation with them. Um, so that's one major change. Um, you know, we see changes uh, across the board. I, 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 I um, I'm a bit of an expert in the graphics side. So for me, I spend a lot of time talking to, um, to graphics artists and the graphics teams at networks. And, you know, I actually just had a, um, had a, um, a call today with, um, with the graphics um, team where, you know, they're looking at these brand new operations um, that, you know, they've never been put in, that they've never experienced before. And, and from their perspective, they used to have to go through a lot of hops to make any sort of effort into getting those graphics on air and do it the right way. Um, now, uh, using um, these workspace tools, using AWS tools, they can really rapidly jump into a workspace. They can jump into the live environment for a graphics tool. They can assemble those assets and really start rapidly prototyping them when traditionally you'd have to be on-prem. You'd have to have you know, a playout server with the graphics tool all on site, the graphics team would have to take those assets, go to a machine, or you would install a machine, you know, in the graphics office. And there was a lot of hardware involved and there was a lot of complexity for them involved. And now even just for the graphics artists as one small side of this, um, their efficiencies are greatly enhanced with the new, you know, with the new possibilities that you know, working remotely and using these types of spaces provide. So that's, from my perspective, and I think from the operator perspective, that's really going to be the big difference is just efficiency, giving them more time to focus on the things that matter in the job and less time worrying about how do I accomplish the task. We have another, <clears throat> we have another question from Bill. Uh, what is the support model? Uh, the process of uh, the process when something goes wrong in the network uh, organization or uh, a, a, and disrupt and the distribution model and or the distribution model. 
I'm going to assume that this question is directed at me somehow. Well, I think it's directed. It, it doesn't. Yeah, direct is it, it, is it, is it the I support know. from from your cloud provider or support from somebody providing a service? Using I, the cloud? I think yeah, it's what, what do you question. do when there's an outage? I think that's a general question here. What, what do you do when there's an outage and who do you call? Yeah, so from, from our perspective, you know, the, the broadcast vendor perspective, we try to make the cloud-based support model as similar to the on-prem support model as we possibly can. So if you're buying, you know, play out as a service from us in a, in a true kind of SaaS model, we're your first and only phone call. You know, the environment is ostensibly ours, right? Though it is AWS, you know, it's ours to manage and we commit to you know, X amount of uptime in an SLA and we commit to a certain level of service based on, you know, the level of service you, you provided, right? So if, you know, it's an imagine play out system, something goes down, you call 1-800-IMAGINE support and it's, it's, it should be as transparent as, you know, you're accustomed to in your traditional video server on, on the ground. It gets a little nuanced as, you know, the industry is making this transition. I don't think the industry has fully adopted a true SaaS model like that. You know, if you look at the, the, the networks we stood up for Sinclair recently, right? Those are imagined playout licenses managed in their AWS subscriptions, right? You know, so there was a lot of very careful upfront diligence around, you know, we will still be the first phone call, right? But it, it, it created some, you know, different kind of business models with AWS and the customer that are a little less than traditional. So, you know, the ultimate goal, it's a single phone call, just like you're used to, but it, there's there's a couple hops I think until we're a hundred percent there as an industry. I have a similar answer, uh, but I I'll tell a story about what we've learned. I, I think is probably the the way to put it, which is, uh, you know, I guess as a media person, I've been on this journey with the customers in, in one way or another, where we're noticing things along the way that could be improved and. Uh, one of those things was identifying what the right support tier is for for customers who need live video. Um, the first thing I'll say is the best, uh, I guess the best defense is a good offense here. So if you're, we should be talking about good architecture before we need to support it, not afterwards. And I've noticed the biggest mistake that customers make um, is not not telling us what they're doing and then just opening a ticket when something doesn't work and then hoping that the person on the other end of the phone just automatically knows how to support live video. That seems pretty dangerous. And we've noticed that that leads to, uh, let's say, unsatisfactory results. So the, the best thing to do is work with us upfront on the architecture, or work with Chris or you know whomever you're working with, make sure that that's well understood by the support parties involved before you need them. Um, mm -hmm. And that okay. way, when you open a ticket, they have the right documentation necessary to, to know what you're doing so that there's not a lot of time spent trying to figure out what you're doing. Um, so that's, that's good. And then also it helps catch things early because what you don't want is a support ticket where you're trying to fix an outage. What you want is a support ticket where you're trying to fix redundancy. Mm -hmm. So you should have redundancy. And then if something happens, you know, you open a ticket and you're trying to restore that. You're not trying to, you know, get back on the air or something. So that's one. Two, um, we found that the best tier of support for this is, is enterprise support. Because if you go, you know, for example, on AWS, like if you go look at the different support tiers, there's a few of them uh, all the way from, I think, not much or best effort to mm -hmm. you have a dedicated support person, like a technical account manager. And um, in order to get those like right away response times or have a person to call or text, like you really need a, a TAM on your account. Um, 
otherwise like people like me and Liam get pulled in and we, we help, we do like, we never say no. Uh, we always want to help. We always want customers to be successful, but it's just not as fast as it could be because the TAM is the person who has that architecture diagram ready. You call them, they have a phone number, you know, um, there is a 24 by seven phone number. Um, and so you get through to people. It just, I guess, long story short, preparation is the best way to make support tickets go go really really smoothly go smoothly yeah so, so yeah. quick question Who, who's responsible for the first and last mile you know getting into the cloud and getting back out of the cloud uh, is that all it depends or, or... no well <laughs> i guess it depends i i guess it depends because some customers are using the internet in which case the internet like i don't know you you don't really you can call your internet service provider and report an outage and they will do something about it, but they will not necessarily prioritize it. They'll be like, okay, we'll look into that eventually. It's not, not really a high SLA. Five minutes. Yeah, it's not right. So like you, you could do that. Um, and then some customers have direct connect, which is the norm for like linear channels that have live video on them. And so in that case, you usually have a last mile provider like Lumen or Zeo or AT&T what have you, pick your favorite connectivity providers. And in that way, it's no different than it ever was before. Like when you were connecting two facilities and you had a circuit ID and your circuit goes down, you call them and you say, I need to open a ticket, my circuit went down, um, like that. It gets a little trickier when it's like uh, intermittent. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. It's like my circuit is up, but I'm losing some packets here and there and I don't know where, so you know, you end up opening a ticket with everybody. I, I, get, I think this is what customers do. I, think, yeah, I don't know. You open a ticket with everybody and see who who can answer the question first. Yeah, Not it comes down to architecture, right? I mean, if you need a, a, a really high SLA on that, you'll you'll need two ISPs potentially to, right. to feed yeah. into, right? So You should, or yeah, at least so, make sure you're looking at fiber maps that your two circuits aren't overlapping each other somewhere. Yeah. It's a highly variable answer, and it goes hand in hand with the support question. You know, Evan is right. It's all about architecture, and well, it, it, it's the it's yeah, it's it's the the gap still right between. I, you can do anything on on the cloud, but you know, to to really just lift and shift everything there at this stage, there's still a gap of of the having the right knowledge base to be able to to manage these cloud services and spin them up and down, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, you, you know, from you were the internal service provider or used a third party service provider who was brick and mortar, you know, they call you, you just made that phone call and they, they, did, they did everything downstream from that. So I still think there's a bit of a, of a, a, a gray space right now in between, um, you know, full cloud services and, and, you know, what we traditionally are used to historically over the past few years and decades, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing I'd add to this on the, it's all about architecture, it's all about the speediness of the phone call, if you will, is um, just don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to admit you don't know something. I mean, this is hammered into us at Amazon when we join. Like, there's just so much that we don't know. And there's so much about what we're doing that's new that like, you know, I'm sure that Chris and Joe, who've built their system in the cloud, have noticed things about how it behaves that I haven't noticed, even though I work for AWS. And like, I'm sure everybody has that experience. So just talk to people, bring stuff up. Don't assume that just because something worked on-prem that you can lift and shift it and it'll work exactly the same. It might, but it might not. You might have to, to tweak it a little bit. So just testing, testing in yeah, advance testing, is important yeah. and yeah. talking to people. Testing yeah. and yeah, run scenarios. It, it, yeah. yeah. That's one of the big and, benefits of the cloud is that you can spin up services at will. And if it doesn't work, you can knock them down. That's yeah. Right. But I guess ask why afterwards. Is and the why, of course. Like, yeah. don't yeah. just, don't just be like, oh, it didn't work. And then walk away, you know, ask, yeah, of course, ask questions. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't have to go out and buy a million dollars worth of hardware install it all in the rack, pay another, you know, quarter million dollars to you know, <laughs> wire it up and then find out it didn't work. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So I, along the same lines, we have another question from uh, Rich. Uh, where is the biggest fear? And this is, runs along the same lines we've been discussing. Connectivity, reliability, troubleshooting or something else? 
I, I do think it's very much along the same lines as what we've just discussed. I think the biggest risk and in turn the biggest fear is the maintenance of the end to end ecosystem, right? The cloud is reliable. You know, there's a there's a saying, imagine, and I actually believe it to be true, a Versio is more resilient in AWS than it is on the premise, right? You know, I am more confident that a Versio is gonna run trouble free in an AWS environment than it is on a piece of HP bare metal, right? And, and again, I'm open to debate, but you know, that's my viewpoint. I don't believe that AWS is gonna catastrophically blow up. There was an outage, you know, some time ago. Um, they were nearly instantaneous in their communication to us and we in turn to our customers and thank God we had no on-air instances, right? And the very next day we turned from, you know, an exclusively kind of multi AZ, you know, deployment model to looking at, okay, so how do we do multi-region deployments just in case, you know, this, this, this should happen again. So I think, you know, designing those kinds of resilient ecosystems is not the, 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 the challenge, right? I don't think connectivity is a, is a fear. I don't think resiliency is a fear. I think the real risk to air, you know, operations is again, you know, managing through the change that's required to run and operate this thing, right? You know, this is this is new technology. And, you know, again, we try as hard as we can to mimic that, you know, legacy kind of environment, but there are maintenance considerations, there are operational considerations, there are engineering considerations that all have to be very well thought through and executed and planned up front in order to support and maintain it. And so, you know, the biggest risk is not getting that right, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and you know, and now that's my perspective. I, I have another addition to that because I like what you said. One of the things that I don't think we talk about enough in the cloud is how doing maintenance procedures is actually easier. Because like on-prem you have a limited amount of stuff that you're running, like you're probably running redundantly, you have two of something great. But if you want to test a new build Usually what customers do is test it on one channel. They'll call it like a, you know, low revenue channel or something like that. Oh, we'll test this new build over here, mm -hmm. but it's still a real channel and it's still, you know, infrastructure and it's still somebody logging into a production system that might make a mistake and cause an outage versus in the cloud, you can stand it up in parallel. And this goes for anything pretty much. Like if you're building a StatMuck system, you don't have to go and like hope not to trip over 20 wires by accident. You know, that's like, that's a real fear that, people have building systems mm -hmm. on-prem and like now you know in the cloud go ahead stand something up in parallel test it don't touch your production system yeah. and then be like okay i get this and you can even you know like in the devops world you can promote one environment to be the production system at that point and tear down the other one right. and right. it makes this whole getting new builds and new technology thing a lot safer actually i think you know, or traditionally you would upgrade a backup system and run that in parallel with a while for your, you know, your, your main system. And then now you, if it didn't work, you know, now you don't have a backup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the cloud completely negates that, that concern. I have another question from Jeff. <clears throat> when a, when a broadcast workflow is moved to the cloud, do broadcasters typically maintain a physical monitoring and operating plant analogous to the brick and mortar uh, physical version that uh, once existed or are their operations now all done from home? And let's take COVID out of the mix for the moment, but go ahead. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that one. Um, and it's very hard to take COVID out of that conversation, but I'll try. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, our, our- Eventually we, we will return to something normal and Absolutely. you know maybe that normal will be something a little different than what we did before, but there will be more on-prem operations and that sort of thing. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so uh, w w with the Sinclair Emerging Networks deployment, they they made the decision, you know, right off the bat to bring those signals back home to a NOC um, and have that remain in one place. Now we simplified operations across three disparate channels and merged them all into one operation. Um, so that, you know, that provided a level of simplicity there, made it easier for the operators. Um, 
but yeah, I think that's really just going to depend on each customer's unique need. You know, um, you know, each broadcaster's you know unique challenge. Depend, it might even in the future come to depending on the complexity of the channel. The you know the, the complexity involved in the actual operation of it, perhaps. You know, if 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 a, if a network is running a, you know a, a multitude of channels, they might determine that some are you know some might be you know not worthy of but would, would be okay be fine with remote monitoring solely and some might need you know the full knock operation to make that happen i think it might just end up being a mix in the future yeah i i, I think the trend though is to remove dependency on the facility and centralize right so mm -hmm. I don't know, Jeff, that, you know, I see a scenario where operators are, you know, kind of literally working from home, but, you know, the underlying construct is you literally can operate it from anywhere, right? You know, given, you know, some, you know, operational interfaces and, 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 a, and, a, and a minimal kind of, you know, infrastructure to, 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 to monitor. So I think that trend was starting, you know, well before COVID, you know, COVID probably did accelerate it just in terms of sheer cost savings initiatives because ad revenues have, you know, gone down so precipitously. But, you know, I think the, the, the concept of centralizing and, you know, getting fewer facilities, right? And fewer people in the facility is certainly, you know, one of the benefits of, of cloud and one thing that's driving this adoption more quickly. And it's all IP based, right? It's a, you're just need yeah, it's all IP good bandwidth right? into the into the cloud and you can run a, a virtualized monitor wall with uh, regular, uh, you know, kind of desktop workstations and yeah, spin it up exactly anywhere, right? right? right. You, yep. you know, or like yeah. in some scenarios, you know, you, you, you go and run it from your laptop in, in a DR scenario. So I think yeah, you'll see right. it more federated and more, more lightweight, but um, I still think there'll be instances where, you know, especially around live events and things like that, where you'll need a, a, a knock that's, um, you know, central and where people come into on a day by day basis. Yeah, eventually you could see the 24-7 uh, master control disappear and uh, go into a follow the sun model. So everybody's sure. working normal business hours and you just. Yeah. Well, what you'll see is that they'll just be, they'll just be MCRs, right? You won't need on, on staff engineers, on, you know, yeah. network guys, IT guys. It'll be, it'll be a different, a different type of staff that you would have operating these yeah. facilities. So we have a question. I, th I think, Chris, you probably would be best to answer this, but it comes from <laughs> William. Do these cloud services make automation vendors obsolete or do they evolve? Well, I, think, I, I really hope it's the latter. <laughs> I, I think you have evolved, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had. That's why you're evolved. taking support calls now, right? <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, no matter where your playout system lives, it still has to run a playlist. It still has to accept a traffic log, right? So, you know, you, you still need an automation system, right? And so if you look at our, you know, kind of traditional, you know, EDC, you know, industry standard, you know, broadcast facility automation system, you know, that has evolved into a cloud-based model that's not dependent on a hardware device server or hardware air client. And it's all become virtualized. And, you know, now we look to the next step to, you know, remove dependency from Windows and have it run on Linux, so it's more efficient in the cloud. Containerize it, so it's even more efficient. So, yeah, it, it, it's gone from its you know hardware centric self to this kind of you know first lift and shift, and now you know kind of highly optimized you know to then fully cloud native you know automation solution with the front ends looking very much, you know, again, like the ADC, you know, traditional kind of broadcast automation mm -hmm. system that, you know, and love, right? So when it's in the cloud and it's managing, you know, the same kind of functions as a, you know, the, that, that a linear, um, you know, channel, you know, dictates, you know, you still need secondary events, you still need, you know, SCUDI triggering within the, the list, right? You know, mm -hmm. we've had to port a lot of that over, you know, to, to the cloud, which presents challenges, right? You know, somebody asked earlier, uh, are all the channels the same, right? You know, my answer to that is we'd really like them to be, <laughs> right? But, but in but, reality, they're not. <laughs> right. And, you know, and I think, you know, we'll get closer and closer to that kind of, 
you know, cookie cutter model, but, you know, there's still these, you know, little boutique broadcasty things that we're still attached to that our automation system has to support, right? Okay. So, yeah, you know, and doing more like OTT stacks or DIA, right. all those types of things become one, one, that's what play out is now, right? It's it, That's right. So that's exactly right. So, you know, we, 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 we transition those to, to cloud, right? And we're able to fulfill those kind of corner case use cases in the cloud. So, you know, it works pretty well. We're talking to AWS about some things about, you know, using an automation system to schedule, you know, OTT channels, right, you know, that are more cookie cutter in nature. And, you know, I think over time, it'll be, you know, the whole the whole ecosystem will be a lot more scalable and, you know, the ability to spin up and spin down quickly, you know, will will evolve as we kind of grow out of these, you know, corner cases and we're better able to kind of, you know, use the automation system, you know, for speed and agility, you know, versus, you know, kind of boutique use cases, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I see the evolution from, you know, ground-based automation systems to, to cloud. Yeah, so time for one question. more question. Yeah, one more question. We have this may be the final question. We have a, a, a matter of scale. How many linear channels have uh, are currently deployed in the cloud? I ask you all to take a, a stab at that number. Do you mean like globally or? Uh, let's uh, globally confined to the U.S. However you want to. However you want to caveat it. <laughs> so, so if we if we if we categorize it as, as traditional linear channels that are now originating out of the cloud versus all the OTT fast channel, yeah, all those types yeah, of things. Yeah, let's just do linear channels. I, I'm guessing it's 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 5,000 globally, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have I, Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly in the thousands. I mean, Evan, you at AWS probably best answer that, but you start to do the math. I mean, Discovery has, 500 under themselves, right, or, yep, or, yep. or, or more. So it, it's, it's I, I'd say 5,000 is a, is a fair guess. Yep. And, you know, we're thinking about this in terms, you know, again, of kind of, you know, quote unquote, traditional broadcast. You know, if you think about cloud-based channels, you know, that are serving YouTube channels and, you know, all of these direct-to-consumer services, I mean, it's tens of thousands or more. Right. And, and that's the interesting more. thing too about your, what you were talking about previously as well is that the need and the number of, of channels is going to increase, right? You're going to have genre specific channels that you, know, you get the right. prices right rerun right. channel on, on a fast <laughs> platform, right? And, and you're going to see more of those things coming up, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Completely agree. All right. Well, let's, we think we've reached the end of our time here. So uh, thank you very much to all of you. And I hope the audience enjoyed this session. Uh, and we will, uh, we will catch you all somewhere around in the cloud. Thanks for having us, Ed. All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. you very much. All right. Have a Thank good you. night. Have a good night.